and a review of Genghis Khan in the Making of the Modern World by Jack Weatherford. This is a fantastic book on Genghis Khan and his life and times, but also what happened to the Mongol Empire after him. So you might have heard of the Golden Horde in Russia, uh, the Mongol Empire later, and of course the Mongol country today, Mongolia, and the Yun Dynasty in China. At one time, the Mongols had more territory than the Roman Empire ever had. And I want to go through some of the really interesting stuff that happened, uh, or that's in this book, about the Mongols and their various culture and their war tactics. Some very fascinating stuff. So, of course, this is the 13th century. And uh, we start off with some, some few interesting things about his childhood. So it says here that Genghis Khan grew up in a world of excessive tribal violence including murder, kidnapping, and enslavement. As his son in an outcast family left to die in the steppes, he probably encountered no more than a few hundred people in his entire childhood, and he received no formal education. From this harsh setting, he learned in dreadful detail the full range of human emotion, desire, ambition, and cruelty. While still a child, he killed his older half-brother, was captured and enslaved by a rival clan, and managed to escape from his captors. So let's just talk about the military. It's probably the most interesting part. How much did they capture and what were their tactics? So it says here, uh, this is on page, um, uh, this is in the introduction on page 17. Rather than relying on defensive fortifications, Genghis Khan made brilliant use of speed and surprise in the battlefield as well as perfecting siege warfare to such a degree that he ended the era of walled cities. Genghis Khan taught his people not only to fight across incredible distances, but to sustain their campaign over years, decades, and eventually more than three generations of constant fighting. So one definite um, advantage of, that Genghis Khan had is most of his troops were on horses, and they always had more horses than people, and that, able, that allowed them to run into the battlefield, tire the horse out, come out and get an, a fresh horse, and then ride back in. So their endurance was nearly unlimited. The second thing is that they had a very little to none supply line or supply wagon. I can't remember what they call it. Uh, they, didn't, they were self-sustaining. They hunted in the surrounding area when they needed food. They did not have a supply chain or supply train, maybe it was called unlike other armies that would need constant supplies to a, uh, a, a vast number of soldiers that were outstretched on a camp, right? Uh, unlike that, Genghis Khan did have his own self-sustaining ways of keeping his troops fed. In 25 years, the Mongol army subjected more lands and people than the Romans had conquered in 400 years. Uh, what they conquered, it stretched Central America, um, it stretched from the snowy tundra of Siberia to the hot plains of India, from the rice paddies of Vietnam to the wheat fields of Hungary, and from Korea to the Balkans. The majority of people today live in countries conquered by the Mongols. Over on the modern map, Genghis Khan's conquests include 30 countries with well over 3 billion people. As Genghis Khan's cavalry charged across the 13th century, he, with, he redrew the boundaries of the world. His architecture was not in stone, but in nations. This is an important part, too, that um, a very important function of Genghis Khan's escapades was connecting nations that normally had never heard of each other before, especially Europe and China through the Middle East. So it says, your Genghis Khan's empire connected and amalgamated the many civilizations around him into a new world order. At the time of his birth in 1162, the old world consisted of a series of regional civilizations, each of which could claim virtually no knowledge of any civilization beyond its closest neighbor. No one in China had heard of Europe, and no one in Europe had heard of China. And as far as is known, no person had made the journey from one to the other. So, uh, for instance, you might recall Marco Polo. Marco Polo wouldn't do this for another hundred years. So Marco Polo was around 1270 when he traveled to Europe. But this, in this time, we're talking just before this Genghis Khan's reign is about in the early 1200s. So just about the same time. 
and you may have heard of the, the TV show, I don't know if, I think it may be a Netflix show, called Marco Polo, and they actually have him visiting cons. So you can see how there's some historical stuff there, and it's pretty neat to see that. And also some things on government that he changed. Genghis Khan smashed the feudal system of aristocratic privilege and birth. He built a new and unique system based on individual merit, loyalty, and achievement. He created an international law and recognized the ultimate supreme law of the eternal blue sky over all people. At a time when most rulers considered themselves to be above the law, Genghis Khan insisted on laws holding rulers as equally accountable as the lowest herder. He granted religious freedom within his realms, though he demanded total loyalty from conquered subjects of all religions. He insisted on the rule of law and abolished torture, but he mounted major campaigns to seek out and kill raiding bandits and terrorist assassins. He refused to hold hostages and instead instituted the novel practice of granting diplomatic immunity for all ambassadors and envoys, including those from hostile nations with whom he was at war. Now on his role in technology. The Mongols made no technological breakthroughs, founded no new religions, wrote few books or dramas, and gave the world no new crops or methods of agriculture. Their own craftsmen could not weave cloth, cast metal, make pottery, or even bake bread. They manufactured neither porcelain nor pottery, painted no pictures, built no buildings. Yet, as their army conquered culture after culture, they collected and passed all these skills from one civilization to the next. So that was a very important part, this kind of cross-fertilization of the, what the benefits of the East were, the greatest stuff of the East, what the Middle East had, and also some stuff from Europe. And so on that point, they, he says, the Mongols swept across the globe as conquerors, but also as civilization's unrivaled cultural carriers. In nearly every country touched by the Mongols, the initial destruction and shock of conquest by an unknown and barbaric tribe yielded quickly to an unprecedented rise in cultural communication, expanded trade, and improved civilization. In Europe, the Mongols slaughtered the aristocratic knighthood of the continent, but disappointed with the general poverty of the area compared with the Chinese and Muslim countries, turned away and did not bother to conquer the cities, loot the countries, or incorporate them into the expanding empire. In the end, Europe suffered the least, yet acquired all the advantages of contact through merchants, such as the Polo family of Venice. So, that's interesting. Um, if you if, if you read the book, they actually talk about that Genghis Khan went up into Hungary and even into Poland, but stopped because Eastern Europe is poor. It wasn't like France or London or Germany. Eastern Europe was poor, so they didn't go any farther. But the Muslim countries and the Chinese countries were rich, and so that's where they, they uh, focused their efforts. The author also claims that because of the Mongols, Europeans switched to Mongol fabrics, wearing pants and jackets instead of tunics and robes, played their musical instruments with the step bow rather than plucking them with their fingers, and painted their pictures in a new style. The Europeans even picked up the Mongol ex exclamation, hooray, as an enthusiastic cry of bravado and mutual encouragement. Isn't that strange? One thing also I remember reading is that the Pope actually sends envoys. There's all kinds of writings on the Khans, the Genghis Khans, and the Golden Horde as like devils, as just like massive ma amounts of people, and they don't know where they come from, and they swoop down and they just raid. And when they're raiding Poland and, and raiding uh, Hungary, they didn't know where these people were coming from. The Pope actually sent envoys to try to, to um, appeal to the Khan, who is the king, and they're equivalent to a king, and they even uh, I, the the Pope sent um, parts of the Bible, and although at the time the the cons were had no knew of Christianity, and there's actually a point in the book which I'll get to eventually where they actually favor Christianity because of its its cultural allowances like drinking alcohol, which the Muslims did not permit, um, eating meat, which the Buddhists didn't permit. There's, because this, because the um, Genghis Khan's, the Mongol Empire's, uh, was a free religious place.